Welcome to this lecture on what are virus-like particles. I'm Professor Mauricio Comas Garcia from the Autonomous University of San Luis Potosí. And in this workshop, we're going to talk about very general aspects on what are virus-like particles. Well, first, we must define what a virus is. It's a biological entity. It is hard to define whether it's alive or not, and that's beyond the scope of this talk. However, we must point out a few key aspects of a virus. First of all, it can evolve, and most importantly, it can be a very strong selective, selective pressure for a host to evolve. It's an obligated intracellular parasite. This means that outside of the cell, it does nothing. It needs to go inside of the cell in order for the virus to become active. Now, it might be associated with the disease. However, not all viruses can cause diseases and all the pathogenic damage. That means that, for example, in Zika virus, three out of four patients will not know that they were infected with this virus. With polyvirus, about 99% of patients do not even know they were infected with the virus. Only a small percentage of them will develop uh, a very severe disease. Now, a viral particle is just an object. It only exists completely in, when it's outside of the cell, and it will do nothing. It will sit in your hand, on your desk, on your keychain, doing nothing. Nonetheless, it contains the minimal structural element for a virus to infect a susceptible and permissive cell. Now, what is a susceptible cell? It's a cell that has all the surface proteins required for a viral particle to enter a, a cell. A permissive cell is a cell that has all the machinery required for it to be able to complete the viral cycle. That means that a virus can do a lot of things, but it does not have all the components. Therefore, a permissive cell will have the cellular components to allow the replication cycle and to, you know, multiply the genome that is called replication for uh, translation of viral proteins, assembly, egress, and exit. But because it's a particle made of proteins and lipids and nucleic acids, it can be chemically and or genetically modified. And this will be a very important point that we'll uh, address in the following sections. So going back to this very general um, definition, a viral particle has all the structural components, a complete genome. It might contain non-structural proteins and host cell factors, and might not. It's infectious, but it's, it does not always produce a pathogenic damage. So here we can see, you know, this representation of a COVID particle entering a cell and releasing new viral particles. A viral-like particle can contain all or some of the structural proteins, either contains no genome or an incomplete genome, so it's not infection. And most importantly, it can be tailored to almost any need you have. So what are viral-like particles? Well, these are very complex systems or simple. It depends on which virus you're using. But independent of the viral system you will be using to design viral-like particles, you have to understand this, that these are self-assembled structures. It can be self-assembled in uh, eukaryotic or prokaryotic cells, in plants, mammalian cultures, and even in test tubes. And we have to really understand the thermodynamics of self-assembly to be able to tailor our particle particles. These are biocompatible, which will be very important to lower the toxicity of some chemicals. It can concentrate a particular cargo. It can be modified genetically and chemically. And it will allow us to study highly pathogenic viruses or viral proteins uh, using VSL2 or VSL1 requirements instead of VSL3 or 4. And finally, we can use a wide range of product production platforms, platforms, sorry, and we don't even need to use the same production system that was used for the parental virus. Now, in the second part of this seminar, we'll talk about vaccines, 
how we can use the self-assembly and uh, viral studies to understand better viruses using VLPs, how to use them as data carriers for diagnostics or diagnostics, and for gene therapy. And this is very uh, cool and important for neutralization assays. This has allowed us, for example, to test for uh, the presence of neutralizing antibodies against highly pathogenic viruses without having to use those. One of the advantages of VLPs is that they are self-assembled structures. That means that if we understand the self-assembly process, we can use these thermodynamic rules to improve the properties of uh, VLP. Also because they're made of proteins, they're biocompatible most of the times, uh, and if we can link the self-assembly uh, characteristic with the special type of cargo or with some specific characteristic of this cargo, we can use VLPs to concentrate and protect a cargo like mRNA. Also, we can modify them either genetically or chemically. And finally, because we can take a part of a highly pathogenic virus that must be studied in either VSO3 or 4 laboratory and take it and convert it into a non-infectious particles, we can use the system in either VSL1 or VSL2 laboratory, which will lower greatly the cost of biomedical and biotechnological research. First, we're going to focus on the self-assembly properties of viral-like particles. In this diagram, in the upper part, uh, we try to exemplify the two main pathways or the two main assembly pathways that, that viruses have. It doesn't matter whether it's double-stranded RNA or double-stranded DNA. With the exception of polyomavirus and some papillomaviruses, almost all double-stranded RNA or DNA viruses, we can, they will follow two different pathways. First, we have uh, on the left a thermodynamic process that is governed by your normal the standard uh, Gibbs of energy equation and this is a spontaneous process where first there's going to be the self-assembly of the uh, capsid or uh, procapsid and this part will require nothing more than thermal energy. Once that the empty capsid or procapsid is assembled then we're out of equilibrium and then a motor will translocate the genetic material from the outside into the interior of the uh, capsid. This is most of the times governed by highly specific packaging signals. And every time this motor uh, make a half of a turn, or in some cases, a sixth of a turn, it will have to hydrolyze ATP into ADP, thus giving this energy to the system in order to package the genome. In fact, some of these double-stranded DNA viruses are, have packaged so much DNA that they will uh, generate a pressure over 20 or 30 atmospheres. Now, on the lower half, we have single-stranded viruses. It can be either RNA or DNA. And in this process, very little uh, or almost no uh, single-stranded RNA or single-stranded DNA or single-stranded RNA viruses will generate empty capsids. In almost all cases, the genome must interact with the capsid protein in a thermodynamic driven process to assemble a capsid. And this is very important because when you use single stranded RNA, you must remember that the RNA is acting as a scaffold or nucleation site for the assembly of the virion. Now, in particular, we studied the assembly process of uh, cowpea chloracumotal virus, which is depicted here on the left side of the slide. Now, it turns out that if you mix uh, RNA with capsid protein at neutral pH, when the protein-protein interactions are very low, and you do it this by slowly decreasing the amount of salt, and thus slightly increasing the strength of uh, the electrostatic interactions, you will anneal the capsid protein into the RNA. And you can see that in negative staining um, EM or cryo-EM at the bottom of the third row and second uh, column, you will see some aggregates are, they do not have 
a very spherical form. However, in the case of uh, CCMB, when you lower the pH to increase the ionic strength, sorry, to increase the protein-protein interactions, then you will see that variants are formed. And all this, until this point, is governed by thermodynamics. However, once you go and increase these uh, strengths, then you have some kind of hysteresis, hysteresis because when you increase the pH back to neutral, then the capsule does not fall apart. You need to do an extra step to remove the capsule protein layer. Now, it is very important to understand the assembly pathway of your virus because, for example, if you mix RNA and, and capsule protein at low pH and high salt and then you dialyze out the salt, you will increase the protein-protein interactions at the same time as the protein-RNA interactions and you end up with micron-sized aggregates. These are kinetic traps because you have turned on both uh, interactions at the same time. So, the point here is that if you want to mix RNA and capsule protein in vitro to assemble a virus, you must be very careful on how you turn on each kind of interaction. Furthermore, we can control the size of the VLPs. This is true for at least some single-stranded RNA uh, viruses. For example, for a cow chlorotic model virus, when we have RNAs are at least 20-fold smaller than the viral RNA, which is in black, we can generate VLPs of a smaller size, which should correspond to T equals 1, that means 60 captive proteins per VLP. If we have RNAs around 2,000 nucleotides, then we can make T equals 2 VLPs, which means that there are 120 captive proteins per VLP. And only when we're around very close to 3,000 nucleotides, then we can get to the normal T equals 3 symmetry. However, when we go from about uh, 4,500, 5,000 nucleotides all the way to 12,000, then something very interesting uh, happens. We can form T equals 4 capsids, but we cannot create even bigger and bigger VLPs. So these are some transmission like on micro, uh, micrographs where we can see something very interesting. When we're, when we're about three times, uh, sorry, two times the size of the wall type genome, then most of the capsids are, uh, are found as doublets, two capsids that are always together. When we have RNAs that are about three times the size of the viral RNA, most of the particles are in trimers. And we, when we're four times the size of the wall type RNA, we can form tetramers. And we know that this is true because when we add an RNAs, which is an enzyme that digests the RNA, we, pass, we go from doublets, triplets, and quadruplets to just have it singlets. So at least for this virus, in order to have a very efficient packaging system in a protective environment, we, are about, we have a limit about four to 5,000 nucleotides. And this is very important. In this slide, we want to point out one thing. So when we had RNAs that were too long, CCMB capsule protein couldn't grow above certain T number. That means that it couldn't go, go above 240 capsule proteins per VLP because that requires to change quite dramatically the size of the VLP and also the angle, the preferred angle. So in order to solve these CCMB, what they do, these particles, is if you have twice a line view for doublets, which we can see here and in uh, red, and we have three times the size of the uh, wall type RNA, around 9,000, you have triplets, and when you have four times, you have quadruplets. And when you add RNAs, this capsid will fall apart, at least as multimers or multiplets, and you'll remain with, you know, normal looking capsid, but with a uh, cut or digested genome. And finally, we also show that if you use very small RNAs, you can package several of them per VLP, such that either you have 2,000 nucleotides in a T equals 2, or 3,000 nucleotides in a T equals 3. And at least between 500 and 140 nucleotides, these VLPs are very stable. However, when you go to length shorter than that, like the size of a sinusing RNA, at least in our hands, these VLPs were not very stable. 
and I won't go into detail about why, but you, we have to be careful of how short you want to go because not also the packaging efficiency could decrease, but the stability of the particle will decrease also. So how can we change the assembly pathway of a VLP? For example, for naked viruses uh, that can be assembled in vitro, then we can use uh, several uh, tricks to increase the strength of protein-protein interactions. We can do point mutations, deletions. This is very important to remove some, hydro, uh, some uh, highly basic uh, termini. Fusion with hydrophobic proteins, this was shown by Alan Ryan with, for example, HIV. Or if you are going to do it in vitro by adding uh, salt or changing the pH. And for example, for plant viruses or phase diagrams uh, that can be explored to favor empty capsids over uh, uh, fully loaded capsids. Now, if we have enveloped viruses or more complicated viruses, we have to do this in vitro. And these can be also uh, be done by point mutations, deletions, or fusion with hydrophobic uh, proteins that can oligomerize. Now, we're going to focus on this ability that VLPs have to concentrate and protect the car. So normally when we have liposomes, the concentration inside of the liposome of the cargo of interest, it's in equilibrium uh, with the outside and, you know, it follows all the chemical potentials uh, laws from thermodynamics. Sometimes you can favor a low ionic strength, increase the amount of cargo by adding very large amount of cargo, especially that can interact through electrostatic interactions with the inner uh, layer of phospholipids. However, if you increase ionic strength, there, you're going to disfavor this process. Now, unlike that, uh, BLPs allow us to increase the concentration of the cargo because we can establish very strong protein RNA or protein cargo uh, interactions. How can we modify genetically or chemically? So we can modify genetically VLPs. For example, we can express all the structural proteins or either a enveloped or not enveloped uh, virus, but not the genomic RNA, and, the, and thus we can produce structurally identical VLPs to the parental virus, but in the absence of the genomic RNA. And at least for E. coli has been shown that VLPs ensemble an E. coli that package E. coli uh, messenger RNAs are very effective vaccines because the mRNAs from the bacteria act as very strong adjuvants. Then we can, we can combine this idea and add, you know, a modified protein. It could be a surface protein or extra proteins to add novel um, antigenic size to a VLP. Furthermore, we can uh, create VLPs in which the messenger RNA of interest that we want to deliver to a cell is modified by adding a packaging signal that corresponds to the parental virus and this will allow selective packaging of the viral RNA well, not really of the viral RNA, but of the messenger RNA that has been modified to contain the viral packaging signal and this can be done either with the normal glyco glycoproteins or even you can add some foreign glycoproteins and finally, for example, Trevor Douglas in um, Indiana University has done a lot of work with this idea uh, where you can add enzymes to have reactive sites within a VLP. And now another interesting idea is that one could express uh, the structural proteins of a virus that could be in blue here, I represented the wild type. And then we can, we can add some uh, structural proteins with a particular modification uh, so that they assemble into mosaic viral-like particles uh, structures. The idea to have these mosaic particles is that probably you don't want to have all of your proteins modified because it could, you know, introduce some steric interactions that negatively impact assembly. But we could uh, modify them such that we have, you know, a one-to-one -one or three-to-one ratio. This actually has been used as uh, the licensed vaccine. So the licensed vaccine, the L1 protein from 
uh, human papilloma virus was modified so it can assemble and you can make empty uh, viral like particles that have been used as a vaccines. But now the idea of the next generation vaccines is to add a second protein L2 such that, that we can add more antigenic sites and present more antigens to the immune system, have a stronger immune response. Now here this L2 normally is inside of the virus and the idea is to modify it, the structure of the L1, L2 fusion such that the L2 antigens are presented on the outside. For example, in our lab we have been working with a small virus which is uh, between 16 to 20 nanometers in diameter and it has 60 capsule proteins and one copy of the genome. Here is the structure of the capsule protein. And what we did was to add uh, uh, an oligomeric protein. And we did this because we wanted first to do two things. The first thing was to exclude air, any uh, genome from being packaged. And the second was to increase the size of the VLPs. So we were able to generate a quite heterogeneous mixture of VLPs that go from 35 all the way to 150, even 300 nanometers. And this approach has been very useful, although we haven't been able to tailor it to just a monodispersed population. We have been able to create these very large VLPs that will contain thousands of epitopes or uh, you know, protein sequences that are recognized by the immune system per VLP rather than just having 60 or 180 uh, epitopes. Well, now let's take a look at, uh, at this bacteriophage, MS2. Now, something very interesting is that you can take and disassemble a virus and depending on the chemical or genetical modifications you do, you can uh, have uh, mosaic capsule proteins in which you have, you know, pentamers or exomers with one-to-one -one ratio of some modified protein or, in, or even have a very small amount of one or the other. Uh, so this is what we can find in uh, A and this allows you to uh, create uh, particles with very special uh, biological and chemical signatures. In figure B, we can also, this is very interesting, you can assemble uh, VLPs around quantum dots or gold nanoparticles, and this will give your system a novel physical and chemical properties that will allow you to use light uh, to give a special uh, characteristic. Now, the only detail here is that, for example, if you're going to use an RNA virus, the quantum dots or uh, viral nanoparticles, um, nanoparticles must be negative charge so that the uh, capture protein can assemble around. You might have to add some linkers or you, you must have the right size in order to have the, the, give the right curvature. Uh, figure C also we can mutate and add tags so you can create very uh, chimeric uh, particles that can be, uh, for example, purified by using nickel affinity columns. So you can add uh, histacking loops and you can end up with highly purified chimeric properties. And then here at the, the bottom uh, figure, you can combine both. You can make uh, MS2 capsids and you can add a functional cargo and then you can modify some residues on the surface so they can, can later on have click chemistry to bind uh, aptomers and then you can have a functional particle on the outside and, and in the uh, inner part and then you can you know uh, the functional cargo can go selectively some places so here they were able to put inside 180 molecules because, because there are 180 capsule proteins and you can do the same with the uh, outer part and the cell aptomers. Now we're about to finish this first part and I want to talk about the production platforms that can be used. There are a wide range of platforms that can be used. Now you have to be very careful which one you want to use. You, you can use bacteria, yeast, plants, mosquito cells or mammalian tissue cultures. 
for example, the cheapest one is bacteria, then it's followed by yeasts and plants, and the most expensive one are mosquito and mammalian tissue cultures. But you have to be very careful and understand the assembly pore properties and the assembly pathway of the parental virus that you would like to modify to make BLPs. For example, if you want to make naked viruses, that means that they do not have any uh, lipid bilayer, then you can use any of these systems. For example, we have tried to use a um, mammalian expression system in cells, in mammalian cells, for VLPs are derived from a pathogen that infects um, animals, and it turns out that the just expression of a capsid protein was toxic. Then we had to move to bacteria. Now, if you want to make, for example, envelope VLPs, you have to ask yourself, do I know where assembly occurs? Because if it occurs at the plasma membrane, then for example, yeast and plants are not a good choice because of the cell wall. Then you'll have to use mosquito and mammalian tissue cultures. Uh, if assembly requires lots of cholesterol because of lipid rafts, then mosquito cells are not a good choice. But for example, if we were to create VLPs of uh, flavivirus like dengue, then you could easily use yeast or plants because assembly happens in the rough and the plasmic reticulum. And then you could use any of these system except for bacteria. Now, what are the advantages of using bacteria? First of all, low cost, very high yields. It is very easy to scale using uh, bioreactors. Now, it's very easy to control the yield. You can change the culture, uh, temperature of the culture. You can go from 16 uh, Celsius to all the way to 37. You can have induction time or production time of 24, 48 hours or six hours. You can uh, induce uh, expression at low or high uh, uh, cellular densities. For small batches, you can use uh, IPTG to induce uh, translation of your protein of interest. But if you want to scale it up, you can use something very cheap as lactose. You can, you know, use uh, mineral media that do not have any uh, products from tripton or yeast, which will lower your cost, uh, the cost. And then you can have different types of agitation to increase the oxygen concentration. Also, there's a wide selection of antibiotics, so you can only choose the bacteria that is modified with the plasmid. And finally, it's very easy to purify protein from bacteria. However, there are some disadvantages. For example, overexpression of capsule protein results in formation of inclusion bodies, and that leads you to having to use uh, denaturing conditions and refold the protein. That doesn't work all the time. You cannot assemble envelope viruses, as we mentioned before. It's very hard to achieve post translational modifications if you need, to, you need to add glycans. This is very hard. There are some ways to do it. But uh, most of the protein, when you add uh, these uh, enzymes to add sugars into the protein, the protein will collapse and crash out of solution. And then you have to be very careful because you have to check the levels of in the, on the toxins, I mean lipopolysaccharides, because these can generate a uh, allergic or even toxic response in a host. So you have to be very careful that your BLPs do not contain endotoxins. Now, G's plants and even algae in the, in the lab were starting to work with algae. It's also very low cost, also high yields, easy to scale. And you can now start uh, assembling some envelope viruses such as Zika virus that uh, assembles into the rough uh, endoplasmic reticula or SARS or SARS or coronaviruses because they assemble into the Golgi or in the Golgi. In some cases, you can have selective media for some algae and G system. You can add some um, some nutrients that normally will be toxic for the system, and only when the organism is modified with DNA, then it will survive. Was it it's embedded? Some envelope viruses cannot be assembled, like chikungunya, which assembles in the plasma membrane. Uh, normally, the uh, post-translation modifications are not the same as mammalian cells, but well, if you compare it with uh, E. coli, it's better, something than nothing, of 
post translational modifications. Now, purification is not as straightforward as with bacteria or mammalian cells. And at least in our hands, algae can be very challenging. It's not that easy to transform algae and to make them generate very large amounts of the protein of interest as it will happen with plants or even yeast. Mammalian and insect uh, expression platforms have an advantage that they're very easy to transform. To transform plants and algae, you need to use bacteria. So first you need to, tra to transform the bacteria and then transform the plant of the algae. However, mammalian and insect cell lines can be actually easily scaled. You can use uh, expensive and sophisticated systems like lipofectamine, or you can use um, a calcium chloride and a phosphate solution to create these aggregates of DNA with phosphates. You also have a wide range of conditions. You can grow them in monolayers, in suspension, in a wide range also of temperatures. You can go 16, 28, 37 degrees Celsius. A very good point here is that normally VLPs can be released to the supernatant, which will downstream during purification make your life very, very easy. You will have all the post-translational modifications as a parent and the parental virus. And normally, uh, because you will collect VLPs from the supernatant, it's very easy to purify them. Some of the disadvantages are that to achieve uh, stable transfection like you will achieve with plants, algae, and bacteria is quite challenging. Also, Dealing with mammalian insect cell cultures are very, they require very uh, sophisticated or specialized environments and they're very costly. They're hard to scale, especially if they're grown in as monolayers. If you start with suspension cells like XP293, then you can scale them, but this is very expensive. And as mentioned before, you will require specialized infrastructure. Finally, I want to point out that, for example, this is a piece of DNA that codes all the structural proteins from chikungunya under a uh, mammalian expression and system. And it turns out that here, Narat and also Metz published that uh, if you produce this VLPs in HEC293 T cells, which is a mammalian culture, you will get particles that look just like the wall type virus which are all the ones you can see here. And here, when you produce them in SF21, these were positive for all the glycoproteins, but you can see the morphology is very, very distinct. And this point has not really been uh, exploited and has not been studied, but uh, we just published a book about building uh, SARS coronavirus BLPs, well, it's a chapter in a book, and it turns out that also for SARS and MERS, the morphology of the viral-like particles greatly depend on the type of cell cell line you're using, and that has to do a lot of it, a lot of the times with the composition of the plasmatic membrane. And here it's the same problem: insect cells do not have cholesterol, so it's possible that in the absence of cholesterol, the assembly of chikungunya virus is not correct. Well, we have finished the first part of, of this seminar, and now we're going to move into the applications and biotechnological and biomedical uh, future of BLPs. Thank you very much.